Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2024 Nova Scotia Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture webinar series. This is our second webinar in the series. Today we will have an update to industry and we'll also recognize winners of the 2024 Minister's Award. My name is Karen Densmore. I'm the Internal Communications and Engagement Lead with DFA. Before we begin today, I will share a land acknowledgement. This land acknowledgement and recognition statement help us to remember and understand the longstanding histories and legacies of colonization that have directly impacted the communities we serve. It also allows us to express our intent to create spaces that are welcoming and inclusive where everyone belongs, working towards truth, reconciliation, and equity. We are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British crown. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We all have responsibilities as treaty people to continue the path of reconciliation. In the same spirit, we would like to recognize that Nova Scotia is home to over 50 African Nova Scotian communities whose culture, heritage, and histories have been and remain a key part of the province for more than 400 years. So welcome everyone. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes today. We are on Zoom, if you haven't been on Zoom before, uh, and everyone will have their audio and video turned off for this session. Uh, just keeps the line clear. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can just click in there and type it in. The Q&A will be monitored throughout the session and we will have questions, time for questions at the end of all the presentations. What I love about this webinar series is that any questions not answered uh, will be collected, gathered, answered and sent back out to the participants. So we have three presentations today. Our format today is that we will have pres presentations and then we'll have uh, some awards in between. So our presentations today are Dan Fleck, Project Manager of Brazil Rock 3334 Lobster Association, Mark Dontremont, Owner and CEO and Founder of Catchy, and James Craig, CTO and Co-Founder of Remote. So that's just to give you a heads up of what is to come. And now I would first like to introduce to you our Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture, Minister Kent Smith, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Karen. Much appreciated. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is great to have all of you here today. Um, you know, we know that getting together virtually means we can connect wherever we are in the province. Uh, and I believe that we have folks on the call today that are some in the South Shore and some all the way up in Cape Breton. So it's great because uh, I know how busy this time of year is and, and getting together physically would be would be far more challenging. Um, we know that it's already May, which means that the snow crab industry and uh, the fishery in the eastern part of the province and the Gulf are well underway. It's lobster season throughout most of the province. So there's lots of activity happening in many of our communities. So please know when I say this, that it, it's truthful, that I really, really appreciate everyone taking the time to, to be online with us here today. Uh, this is the second webinar in a series that we're planning. Uh, the goal is to come together and share information in a way that works for everyone involved. We hosted our first webinar back in February and we shared some really good departmental updates. And I'm happy to report that we heard some really good feedback from that session. And so today we're gonna to follow a similar format. During this webinar, I'll be presenting the 2024 Minister's Awards of Excellence for Commercial Fisheries and Aquaculture. And the categories that we're looking at today are innovation, product quality, sustainability, and we have a special lifetime achievement award that I'm really proud to be presenting. Uh, we also have an opportunity, as Karen alluded to, to hear some presentations that are really interesting on some of the cutting edge work that's taking place in our province. So Brazil Rock 3334 Lobster Association is going to provide an update on the first of its kind project, lobster boats using wind and solar power to reduce the reliance on diesel. And tech startup Ketchy will talk about the precision fish harvesting system and is developing. It has no contact with the ocean floor. 
And finally, Blue Grid by Remote will share an update on the technology that powers electric boats while also supplying energy to the grid. So I'm excited. It's going to be a great session this afternoon. And for me, from the department side of things, there are a few things that I'd like to highlight. So folks who know me know that I work pretty linearly. Linearly, So there are the three things that I wanted to share with the group today. Uh, the first is the recent announcement of the Argyle Aquaculture Development Area. So back in April on the 15th, we were down at the municipal building in Argyle to announce the first of its kind aquaculture development area. So we call it an ADA. It's a pilot project that will save industry time with pre-approved sites for growing shellfish and marine plants. The new approach involved working with the municipality and other partners to do a lot of the hard work up front. And working together, we collected information about the potential aquaculture sites and then shared it with community before creating the ADA and issuing the first call for proposals. It took four years of hard work by many, many folks to get this project across the finish line. And the municipality has been an excellent partner. The ADA would not have been possible with their enthusiasm and support. Uh, and we're really, really proud to partner with them. I really look forward to seeing how this aquaculture development area develops over time. And also really proud, proud to share that the day we announced the ADA on the 15th of April, we also uh, announced six sites that were open to be to be proposed upon. Uh, and you can find the information on how to make your proposal on the department's website under aquaculture public information. The second thing that I'd like to address to the group today is uh, a little talk about climate change. So our seafood companies are already making the commitment investments needed to reduce their energy use and emissions. Great work is being done through the on-site energy manager at Efficiency Nova Scotia that we fund. To date, we've seen industry reduce their GHG emissions by more than 5,500 metric tons, and that is equivalent to taking 11,000 cars off the road. And just a side note to say that when I first started in this role in September, that number was 10,500. So just in the last eight months, we've improved by that, that amount. Uh, we want to support industry to do even more, and we'll have an update to share soon on further support for the energy efficiency within our sector. I would also like to highlight some of the work we're doing with the industry with industry and research partners under the climate plan. In March, our research partner, CMAR, released the results of a study on climate change and the lobster fishing industry. The assessment provides a baseline on lobster and lobster harvesting. We and our partners can use and build on this information as our work as we work with the sector continues. And the study will help us identify ways we can further support industry to adapt to and mitigate the impacts of climate change on the sector and on our coastal communities. And you can find a copy of the full report on CMAR's website under projects. My third and final update for today is surrounding uh, enforcement. So last year, we know that Minister Craig committed to increasing fines to up to $1 million. And I'm very, very proud to say that we passed legislation in the spring session that brings the minimum, pardon me, the maximum fine uh, for convictions under the Coastal Resource Act to $1, to $1 million from $100,000. And for subsequent offenses, the maximum fine increases to $2 million. And this change is a strong deterrent to illegal activity. We do trust the courts to put the appropriate fine in place on conviction. We as a province are willing to step up and do more on enforcement within our jurisdiction. Fisheries and Aquaculture is working with the Department of Natural Resources and Renewables to support this effort. And we will continue to make it loud and clear to the DFO that we expect them to do the same. So those are my three updates. And I think all of us here today can agree that the hardworking people in our seafood sectors deserve a lot of the credit. And we are certainly a, a small place, but do we ever make a big difference in the world when it comes to seafood? Our industry works hard to provide high quality local products that have earned a global reputation. And we certainly hear about it when we go to trade shows around the world. We do it with a clean, sustainable future in mind. And we are, as a department, very proud to support industry. With that, I wanna thank you for being here today. I hope you enjoyed this session and the opportunity to share your thoughts and ask questions at the end of today's program. I'd like to thank everyone involved in organizing today's webinar and to all of our industry presenters this afternoon. And also, thank you to Perennia for handling all the technology today and certainly for Karen for keeping us on schedule. And I will turn things back over to Ms. Densmore and ask her to introduce our first award. Thank you, Minister. 
for sharing an update with us all. Uh, it's now time to present the 2023 Minister's Awards of Excellence in Commercial Fisheries and Aquaculture. These awards are being presented virtually this year under a new format. Minister Smith will announce the four awards and after each one will play a short video message from the recipient. In between the awards, as I mentioned, we'll have the three presentations that the minister mentioned earlier. Each of our presenters will highlight exciting and emerging technologies in our sector. So let's get started with the Sustainability Award, which is new this year and an important one as environmental sustainability is a focus for everyone here. Minister, would you please present the award? Certainly. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I'm certainly really, really pleased to present this award to, do we have drum rolls in the background? No? Hamilton's Fish Farm and recognize their commitment to sustainability. Hamilton's Fish Farm has made great strides in their pathway to net zero, including the installation of a 250 kilowatt grid tied solar power system. This project is a model for increasing sustainability while raising and processing land-based finfish. Congratulations to Hamilton's Fish Farm, and thank you for your leadership and sustainability. Great, and we have a quick message from them. On behalf of uh, Hamilton's, uh, myself, Maddie, and our staff, uh, we would like to thank you very much for the nomination and the um, the award, and we hope to we hope to uh, do more in the future. Great, thank you Hamilton's Fish Farm. So deserving of this award. So now we're gonna go into our presentations and our first presenter is Dan Fleck, project manager of Brazil Rock 3334 Lobster Association. Brazil Rock was founded in 2017 and is the largest single species association in Canada. The association represents industry members in lobster fishing areas 33 and LFA 34, with a goal to support long-term sustainability of this fishery. Today, Dan's talk will be about a new technology that some members have adopted. Go ahead, Dan, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Karen. If I could have just a quick thumbs up, if you can hear me okay? Perfect. Perfect, Loud thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Minister Smith. I wish to begin by thanking you for permitting me to appear before you today to provide some background information on a recent success story that the Brazil Rock 3334 Lobster Association has experienced. First, let me tell you a little bit about our, our association. As stated, we were formed in 2017. We represent lobster harvesters from Eastern Passage, just outside of Dartmouth in LFA 33, around the South Shore, up to and including Digby in LFA 34. We support owner operator. Uh, we support a sustainable lobster fishery for present and the future. And we will cooperate with like-minded organizations. Our lobster season begins the last Monday of November each year and continues to the last day the following May. When not at sea, lobster vessels are secured alongside at wharfs. However, not all wharfs have shore power. When shore power is not available to these vessels, the captain must attend once per day and start the diesel powered engine to charge the vessel batteries. During winter months, it is necessary to run the diesel engine continuously for several hours to ensure that the vessels onboard water lines, navigation equipment and associated electronics do not freeze and fail. This is costly both to the environment through the emission of diesel generated greenhouse gases, as well as financially to the vessel owners. This project provided an alternative to both using shore based power and diesel to charge batteries when connected to various wharfs. The wind driven turbines accompanied by solar panels purchased and installed upon participating lobster vessels that are members of Brazil Rock Association resulted in a reduction of diesel fuel and greenhouse gas emissions. This is the first of its kind in the area and provides a clean energy alternative to current practices and is an important demonstration for the lobster fishing sector as it moves towards continuously improving its environmental stewardship. Fuel is expensive and greenhouse gases increase the effort of delivery. Please allow me to describe the equipment, the hybrid solution. Solar is utilized as a power generation medium in this application. 
Wind is being used in conjunction with solar, solar for system redundancy and more uniform power generation. The wind resource. Solar accounts for 30% of more of power generation capacity. The wind resource is focused on for solar assistance, which during winter months when wind is at its peak. Southwestern Nova Scotia has sufficient wintertime winds to support the power needs. A wind resource of four meters per second or 16 kilometers per hour is the minimum average winter speed recommended to install a turbine in a hybrid system with the accompanying solar panel. The purchase and installation of wind driven turbines accompanied by solar panels installed upon lobster vessels so that the reduction of diesel fuel can be achieved. Three 150 poly solar panels or 450 watts. This wattage may vary depending upon a vessel's needs, the size and the quantity of panels. An example might be two 220 watt panels. Panels should be installed at an angle equal to the degrees of latitude at location. The control panel depicted here displays the watts generated by the level of charge on the batteries and prevents overcharging and potential damage to the batteries. AirX Marine 12 volt or, 25 or 24 volt turbine wind controller. The controller panel depicted here displays the watts generated and level of charge on the batteries and prevents overcharging and potential damage to the batteries which will cause the turbine to stop. Once the batteries reach their full power, the, the charging stops. As well, an 8DM planar heater will shut down automatically prior to the battery being depleted. This is a safety feature. All equipment is CSA and Transport Canada approved and professionally installed. Here you can see a solar panel array accompanied by the turbine upon the wheelhouse of a participating vessel. This captain has experimented with the position of solar panels and has decided to place the panels upon a pole immediately adjacent to the wharf. This is necessary due to the panels being blocked by periods of low tide when the panels can't see the sun. Here you'll see an article that was published by Saltwire Media a positive story which has greatly increased the interest of membership. There are some math calculations here. So approximately 280,000 liters per fuel are saved per year or 627 metric tons of greenhouses, greenhouse gases saved per year. Um, it is necessary to acknowledge the exemplary service that DFO FACTAP and Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture FACTAP staff have provided. From the inception of the project, through the pro throughout the project, Laura Purdue and Jason Fernet have been extremely understanding, patient, and willing to impart their extensive knowledge. The Brazil Rocks Hybrid Wind Solar Carbon Reduction Project 2023-A006 would not have been successful without Laura's guidance and leadership. And uh, Minister Smith, I would also like to thank you personally for all of your staff throughout the area. Emily Surratt and Dan Mumberkett that we deal with routinely down here. Great staff and thank you everyone. And I'm available to take any questions now or later. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we will hold questions until the end, but if you have a question for Dan, you can put it in the Q&A. And uh, as we go through it, it might be a good idea just to mention who your question is directed to. So when we go back to them at the end, we'll know who, where to direct your question. Okay, so just pop in the first name of the presenter to Dan, your question, and we'll take it from there at the end of the session. Uh, thanks so much, Dan. Very interesting presentation. Thank you for the kudos to staff. It's always nice when we can hear that. And um, so appreciate that. And as I mentioned, if you have any questions, just pop them in there. So now we're going to go to our next, uh, our next, our next award. And I'm just going to bring it up here, Minister, and then I'll have you introduce it. Thank you, Karen. And while you're doing that, I'll just uh, echo your sentiments to thank Dan for the presentation and for the shout out to the team. It is uh, a team that scores very, very highly on engagement, which means they like where they work and what they do. And so uh, I don't think I have anything to do with that, <laughs> but I certainly will uh, enjoy hearing that the team is, is doing a great job. So thanks, Dan. And if we're ready, 
Karen, are we ready for the next yes, one? Yes, I'll now. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. We're moving a lot of things around here, so appreciate that. So I'll now call on you to um, to uh, present the Quality Focus Award, which shines a spotlight on companies that produce our premium seafood products. Over to you, Minister. Thank you again, Karen. Uh, it is certainly my honor to present this award to Abriel Fisheries Company and celebrate their longstanding commitment to product quality. In recent years, the company has had to come over, overcome the loss of their facility during a fire in 20, uh, 2019. And since then, Abriel, Abriel Fisheries has rebuilt and modernized their operation from the ground up. This has included adding new lobster holding facilities and equipment for their saltfish operation. Congratulations to the Abriel Fisheries Company and thank you for your dedication to product quality. Great, and we have a little message from them. I'm Abriel from Abriel Fisheries in Tangier, Nova Scotia. I wanted to say thank you so very much for this, re this recognition. As you had stated earlier, we did lose our facility in 2019. And I guess out of necessity, it gave us the opportunity to sort of look more to the future. So when the rebuild start over a two year period, we did make sure that the uh, shellfish lobsters particularly were going to be able to be um, able to be held in a longer capacity. So we uh, did cold storage facilities and we also have to thank the problem, the province. Uh, we had the Atlantic fisheries fund support us in that area. We also are a heavy salt fish facility and they also helped us in that. Um, so thank you very much. It's much appreciated. Uh, it's an old business and we've been here a long time and we couldn't do it without our community and, and our fishermen and, and the people that have seen us through this, this bit of uh challenging times but uh, we're on the other side of it and are looking forward to a bright future so thank you very much we're very very pleased that you've recognized us it's much appreciated great thank you april fisheries company you're an inspiration it was great to hear from you so now we'll move into our presentation our next presentation which is with mark dontremont he's founder and ceo of catchy Previously, he was involved in a fish harvesting and processing company that owned and operated trawlers and owned quota. As a result, Mark understands the challenges faced by harvesters related to bycatch and rebuilding fish stocks. His passion for the industry is reflected in Catchy and its harvesting technology, which eliminates contact with the ocean floor. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you, Karen and Kent, for inviting me to present today. Uh, so yeah, as Karen mentioned, we are, we are reinventing how fish is captured from the oceans and specifically targeting bottom trawl, so lifting the bottom trawl off the net, off the seabed. And we've developed a new technology to open up the net and to control the net as well. So our executive team, myself, that was a nice introduction for myself from Karen, so I'll skip over myself, I guess. Uh, Angie Green, she's a public uh, accounting, she owns a public accounting firm here in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, and uh, she deals predominantly with fishers and fishing industry, and she really understands how the quotas and the things like that can impact financials. And Mark de Young, who's our chief technology officer, uh, in his previous life, he used to be an Olympic paddler, but he's also a very good engineer, and he's very good for us as our chief technology officer. And our main source of funding for this project was the Ocean Supercluster that started in 2021 and also Schmidt Marine and Ocean Kind, which they're philanthropy uh, money from the US. So that's how we're funding this project. So what is our technology? Um, so first of all, we're removing the need for trawl doors completely with these things that we're calling hydropox. So there's a series of discs that go along the cable and when you pull it through the water, it inflates the net like trawl doors would. Another thing we're doing is we're automating the net. So we're controlling the winches on the vessel to target your species. So the, the captain can input a target depth or a target height off the seabed and the net will go there automatically. So there's two methods, like I mentioned, you can either track the seabed. So you can have your net at a meter or two off the seabed and it will track the seabed automatically without touching any obstacles. So we'll avoid those obstacles automatically or you can move up the water column as well to target your specific species. So 
for things like redfish and, and things like that, that move up and down the water column daily, the system is basically designed for things like that. Um, so the benefits of this, you automate your fishing. Uh, the way we open up the net also saves 30% fuel compared to traditional trawl doors. Because you're not on the seabed, you're reducing your gear maintenance costs significantly. And you can also avoid bycatch again by moving that net where, need, where it's needed in the water column. So this is a picture of our quarter scale version net in the flume tank at Memorial University. So here you can see those discs really spreading the net open. So the way this works is the top ones are float and the bottom ones sink. And then the, the, the mesh in between those hydropucks uh, create tension to make sure they're oriented properly. So this is what the full scale version looks like. This was at the wharf in Pumnico. We're getting ready to do sea trials on the Larry Charles. Um, so this is us deploying the net to, for the first time. So the whole goal around this technology was that we wanted it to build it in such a way that we didn't need to change equipment on deck. So you could use the same net drums, you could use the same winches, you'll have to install just a few electronics and you're on your way. And recognizing that we didn't want fishers and fishing companies to spend, you know, months and, and lots of money at a shipyard, for example, to change fishing gears. And also, you know, you could change fishing gears, you know, as, as needed as well. So um, that was really the goal of this was to make it as simple transition as possible. So here you see it deploying it from the net drum. It looks like a huge mess on the net drum, but it actually doesn't tangle. We haven't tangled it once yet. So that's very good. Um, so very easy to deploy. You deploy it similar as how you would with trawl doors. So, so far so good with that. Um, just, I'm just skipping ahead a bit here just to see, just to show how it goes into the water. So those hydropucks in the water, they look like this. Um, you can see the hydropuck is oriented the way we want. So looking forward and the interbridal mesh is tight as well. So this is another angle of that hydropuck and the angle of attack that we're placing these hydropucks at. This is a video of the automation. So here basically we're setting a depth that the net, we want the net to go in our software. And you can see the winches on the left and the right automatically move until we reach that targeted depth. So for the fishermen, really easy to use, uh, a really simple way to just basically have a better tool for them to use. So what that looks like for the fishermen on the bottom here, they have a control pendant where they have options to click to the depth set point or altitude set point, and they just turn the knob to that depth or the altitude that they want. So very simple. You press the button and it goes, everything happens automatically. And on top, you'll still have a better uh, display for, for more data visualization to kind of picture where that net is in the water column, behind your vessel, things like that. So with this, um, we've done sea, uh, sea trials for now for roughly a year, but recently DFO gave us the go ahead to go fishing. So this is us with our first fish we ever caught. So this is very exciting and right now we're um, trying to just get more fishing data under our belts and really trying to you know start selling these systems so we're quite advanced and we're looking for basically sales at this point um so the results of the sea trials like we mentioned it it, it saves roughly 30 percent fuel um what, one thing we've seen was we can open up a bigger net with while steve while still achieving 30 percent fuel so you could use a big midwater trawl if they wanted to um, and still have significant fuel savings. So you could have a bigger net and still have fuel savings. Another thing too, at the depth, um, the target depth, it, it stayed there plus or minus 0.5 meters and the target distance off the seabed, it also stayed there plus or minus five meters. So we were really happy with that and things are just going to prove, improve as we uh, move forward. And like I mentioned, uh, no tangling or anything when it's being deployed. So our whole goal here is to basically, we can still move the fishing, fishing uh, industry forward without a big, you know, without a big change. I think we can move it seamlessly while, so the fishermen can, you know, still make money. The, the industry can still thrive, but we can still, you know, have environmental goals met to, you know, help with policy and just the um, environment in general. So that's it for me, I guess. Any questions? Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, 
it's exciting technology. Um, if there are questions for Mark, we're just going to ask you to pop them into the Q&A. So just make sure that we know that there are two Mark and uh, pop those questions in and we'll circle back to you, Mark, just to keep things rolling. But thank you so much for that presentation. Thanks. Great. Okay, Deputy or Minister, sorry, we're back online here with uh, more presentations. I'm just going to bring up our next presentation. <clears throat> Uh, it, it doesn't want to go exactly. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So this this next one um, was to present on the Innovation Development Award, which recognizes achievement and innovation. Minister, once again, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you once again, Karen. Uh, I am honored to present this award to Deep Cove Aquafarms and applaud them for their commitment to innovation. Deep Cove Aquafarms has been an innovator through several projects that involve sustainability, efficiency, and increased capacity. Congratulations to Deep Cove Aquafarms for creating change through innovation in their business and our industry. Well done. So, I'm Andy Snare from Deep Cove Aquafarms. I would just like to express my sincere thank you for this recognition from the minister and his whole department. They have been an enormous support for us. Our company have grow, has grown more than 400% in the last couple of years. We have now refrigeration to hold close to a half a million pounds of live lobsters. And a solar. our solar project has made us near net zero in energy consumption. We, uh, for example, I, I can look at our app and see that last week we produced over three megawatts of energy this month so far. And uh, we uh, we really appreciate all the help the whole way along through the couple of years that the province has given us to, to achieve this goal. Thank you very much. Wow, amazing. Congratulations, Deep Cove Aqua. What a great innovator. So this brings us to our final presenter today, uh, who is James Craig, Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Blue Grid by Remote, a professional engineering, a professional engineer and entrepreneur. He started his career as an engineering officer in the Canadian Navy. At Blue Grid, James combines his naval background with his passion for data and Internet of Things. The company's focus is technology for electric marine vessel that are connected to the electricity grid. Well, we're looking to hear, look forward to hearing more about that, James, and I'll uh, pass it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Minister and and, uh, and team. And uh, I'd echo Dan's comments that uh, you have a great team. Uh, they're a lot of fun to work with and very professional. And uh, it's, it's interesting to see kind of these uh, inflection points in technology changes in the industry. And having uh, kind of grown up and gone to high school in Digby, uh, I know what it's like to live in a fishing community. So, uh, you know, kind of it's it's nice to see innovation like Mark's uh, kind of really resonating on the global stage as well. So I'm here to talk about electrifying inshore fleets and um, and and as, especially obviously around the what this means to the uh, Department of Fisheries and, and the fleets that it supports. Um, so including fishing fleets, uh, like lobster, like uh, aquaculture, and, and what that really means. And so what I want to do is, is uh, you know, kind of, I guess the first question we always have is, are, are electric boats real? And uh, I can honestly say that uh, electric, fully electric boats that, that plug in, just like an electric uh, vehicle, um, are a, a reality today. This is actually the ABCO workboat that is running around uh, Lunenburg Harbor, um, potentially, well, I won't say as we speak, we have another test that we're doing with it today. Um, but um, this just shows that the technology uh, can be used um, in a real life scenario. And this includes, you know, going for a 12, 14 hour fishing day, um, returning to port and being able to plug in. And, um, and, and we're helping kind of make that part of it a reality. Um, and some of these technologies developed in Canada, some are developed 
in other parts of the world. Um, you know, we see places like Norway, like the United Kingdom, a little bit further ahead than we are today, and they've just been at it a bit longer. And so we're seeing kind of the technologies that are maturing in those jurisdictions coming over to Canada. And, uh, and we're, we're actually doing um, a part in that technology stack as well. So um, we are based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, but we do projects throughout Atlantic Canada, uh, United Kingdom, and uh, you'll, you'll hear about some other projects that we're doing in the future in other jurisdictions as well. So specifically as a company, um, when we talk about electric vessels, um, there is an expense to an electric vessel um, initially. Um, they are more expensive than a diesel vessel. And, uh, and I know the, the port that Mark uh, sails out of with, in West Pubnico, those, those boats go quite a ways. And those will be hybrid electric vessels or hybrid vessels in the future. Um, but along the North Shore and uh, in the places that, that we work with vessels where they return to port, they're going out for six, eight, 10 hour days. Um, they can be completely supported by electricity and uh, be fully electric. And this helps out both from a decarbonization standpoint um, to reduce kind of the emissions that are happening um, helps out uh, what's happening with respect to the catch that they have. They have a fully kind of green catch. And, uh, you know, we heard in the aquaculture side where, where things are going to net zero. Um, this is true as well if you're on the water. Um, the challenge, of course, is where do you, where do you charge them? And so um, we play a pivotal role uh, working with the Department of uh, Fisheries uh, with their, um, their uh, wharf and uh, inshore uh, team. And uh, we really, really bring that electric grid component to it. And as we know, um, whether you're in Digby, you're in Arisag, you're in, you're in Sydney, you're in Sheet Harbor, is that um, the electric grid is getting more and more kind of strain put on it. Uh, from the perspective that there's lots of things that are looking at uh, from a decarbonizing standpoint, uh, moving to electric. And we see lots of renewables coming on. And so the question is, you know, does an electric vessel, is it just a hindrance to as the grid grows or can it be um, a positive experience? And what we're actually developing is the way that this electric vessel can have the batteries that are on board it um, be unlocked to actually help out the grid and actually be paid for that user as they're putting it on the grid as well. And so we call this bi-directional charging or managed charging. And so we're really at this kind of epicenter between electric vessels, which again, are a real thing, you know, working in, in lots of different environments uh, with an ever-changing grid. And so, you know, we see different um, initiatives uh, that are happening with respect to utility grade batteries. And what we're doing is bringing this whole ecosystem um, you know, just as an example in, with, uh, with lobster fleets, it's there's about 60 or 70% of the lobster fleet today could move to electric vessels. And we're talking about, you know, gigawatts of energy. So the equivalent of a Tufts Cove that are basically locked in with those batteries that could be helping those rural communities actually help sustain a, a better grid for the future. So some of the, you know, kind of the journey to reality, um, you know, when I was putting together the presentation, um, there's really a really good example of where the government has to help, and they have been. And I would say provincially, the government here is, is much, much further ahead than the federal government, actually. And so we've had a, a tremendous amount of support in getting these grassroots initiatives up uh, and running um, without, unfortunately, the help of the, the federal side yet. And that's coming. But, you know, I just want to kind of for you to see kind of what this journey to reality looks like is that there's, you know, there's a journey from the fisher to understand kind of what the, the energy requirements are as they move to electric. Um, you know, again, where Dan, where Dan is with Black Rock, those are a lot of energy intensive boats. But a lot of the North Shore, um, we see, you know, kind of a, a really good uh, uh, proposition there where we can actually see electric boats in the water. And I'll show you some of the, the, the programs that we're actually doing. On the other side of the grid is helping to understand kind of what that charging infrastructure is like. And we see that happening within electric vehicles today is that there are charging initiatives that are happening within the province. We had both federal and provincial initiatives, which are seeing that when they're on four wheels of what that looks like for that charging infrastructure. How that looks like on a wharf in the next five or 10 years will change the look and shape of that wharf dramatically. So what's the energy need to be used uh, to actually get that, that dispenser or that energy uh, piece that plugs in. And then ultimately you wanna get those electric boats in the water and operationally, um, again, is, is 
kind of the areas where we fit. But you see the gray areas are kind of the places where the where Nova Scotia and, and the federal governments are, are really trying to understand what this means, trying to bring the policies to support this um, kind of change in technologies. And then on the other side of the grid side is policies to support basically that that uh, capacity that the, the vessel owner is unlocking. And we do work closely with Nova Scotia Power here locally, who've been a very good champion in, in this as well. So they see kind of this innovative battery storage as part of their ecosystem in the future. Just a very quick overview of the technology that we've developed here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, we call it Blue Grid. And Blue Grid really, again, lives at this epicenter between vessels and grid. And then between managed charging and vessel to grid technologies are really the key components that we, that we do. And just some of the, the projects that we're doing. Um, so we're actually working um, uh, with, with First Nations. Uh, so member two is one I'll highlight here. They're a very innovative uh, band and community. And we're actually working towards having the first fully electric ground up um, electric vessel in the water for 2025 that'll actually be built by member two. This will have about 600 kilowatt hours of battery in it and will actually be used for one of their uh, fishing licenses uh, for next season lobster season. So these are, are, are becoming real and you'll see more and more of these. This will actually hold 10 tons of catch capacity in addition to the batteries that it has on the vessel itself. So the, the whole quandary of will it work in Nova Scotia? Yes. Will it work for fishing? Yes. Will it work for every piece of fishing? No. <laughs> but again, it's it's understanding where it will and won't work. We also have, um, we're helping out with um, the Halifax Ferries electrification component. We have uh, data to help the province and uh, Metro Transit understand what that energy looks like within the ferries. And as we start to electrify ferries, you'll see kind of that come into play. One of the, the reports that we were, that played a pivotal role, I think, in some of the communications that have gone out and informed some of the policies is a recent one. And I say recent, it's actually about a year and a half now, um, but it's the Nova Scotia Lobster Fleet Assessment. And uh, we, we did the energy analysis on this one behind the scenes uh, for a great ENGO called Oceans North. And so, you know, this actually highlighted kind of some of the, where the technologies are, um, what the preponderance was for people to actually make this change and was it, uh, was it a possible change? And so we found out that this is actually a reality uh, within much of the province. Um, the last one that I'll just touch in on the insights portion of it is some work that we did up in Arisag. So this is with commercial lobster fishers. And again, we showed and highlighted that there was a, actually a very good value proposition for them to decarbonize with vessels. And again, because their, their, uh, their work days are between six and eight hours, completely fits within the mission of an electric vessel. And so we're working with them to see kind of what, what potentially the future could hold for them as well. Some of the, so I say that we worked in between the grid and the, um, and the vessel itself. So some of the pieces that we've done, we've, we've done the Northumberland kind of wharf grid, that's an Arisag, looking at what, what are the pieces that the grid needs to do. Um, and then we've also looked at the battery capacity. So again, a bit small, but on the, this, this middle piece here is something that we actually work with, with Dalhousie University with Renewable Energy Storage Lab. And we were able to come up with basically what's the capacity for electric vessels um, to actually make an impact on the grid. And so what you're seeing is kind of the blue and red where there's positives and negatives to the grid based on the capacity and availability of vessels. And so this helps out both the province develop policy, but also for Nova Scotia Power to see that this is actually an important piece. And again, from the, the lobster the electrification assessment, we just touched on the grid piece as well. So last but not least from um, kind of projects underway, which are kind of the more ex the, the exciting ones, um, as we speak, literally, um, we actually have the world's first bi-directional uh, test uh, with, with that workbook that I showed you, um, which is Vessel to Grid. And so that's actually happening today here in Nova Scotia. Um, it's the first commercial inshore boat to actually be bi-directionally dispatched by the utility. And so this is a major um, you know, achievement, uh, both on a global stage, but also for Nova Scotia. And it just shows that the, 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 the sector you know, for vessels can interact and, and interoperate very closely with the utility sector. Um, the other one that we're doing, uh, we've just kicked off the project. Uh, I say the RBC project, but RBC was uh, gave us some uh, some dollars to help out uh, look at what the the grid perspective and a community pathway would be. And so we're looking at uh, we're working with the 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 um, a municipality in Southwest Nova uh, to determine what that looks like. And then uh, we'll have some more kind of news. I think uh, within a month uh, as to how that project maybe grows a little bit. 
uh, and uh, once that gets finalized. Um, we've also got a couple of OSC or ocean supercluster projects that are that are going to be happening, and uh, you're 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 seeing basically two of them. One is um, a United Kingdom project that uh, they'll be underway in June, and then the next one is a, a British Columbia and uh, Halifax uh, project will be underway as well. So Nova Scotia as an ecosystem, you know, very vibrant ocean ocean tech sector, and we're taking advantage of that. Um, a very good, willing um, partner on the grid side, and a very good, willing partner, you know, with within provincial and, and federal uh, side. And then, last but not least, just some of the shore studies. Um, so, member two again, uh, they'll have that that fully electric um, vessel uh, with charging infrastructure on the wharf, uh, which will be very interesting. And lastly, is uh, we're working with Pictou Landing First Nation to actually help them do the planning to electrify their complete fleet that runs out of uh, Pictou Landing. And this is nine or 10 vessels uh, that run out of there. And they also run some other vessels at a shedding camp, but we'll see that'll be a future project. So again, lots of things happening here in the province on electrification. It is here and now. Um, you know, I was just at a recent uh, um, conference and, and uh, wanted to kind of show kind of overall, you know, kind of what we're doing here. But again, think of us as a shoreside charging partner we're working with, you know, the, um, the different boat builders around Nova Scotia as they start to look at electrification and the different fleet owners as they're looking at it as well, again, with the support of the, of the province and, uh, and, and the federal uh, pieces. I was just at a, a conference in, in Fredericton and they asked us to say, what, what do five years look like uh, out from now? And, you know, the thing you talk about the technology now, I, you know, I think that what I can say honestly is that, that there'll be commercial fishing and aquaculture fleets that have electric vessels operating every day. You know, that'll be part of the ecosystem. It's quiet. It'll attract new new people into the industry. You, you're not, you know, smelling diesel fumes all day long if you're running an aquaculture boat or a fishing boat. Um, and it'll just help from a decarbonization standpoint. It's, you know, 88,000 kilograms of CO2 annually coming out of the lobster fleet. You know, if we can save some of that, that that goes to the minister's uh, point of how, do, how we save some of these uh, these pieces. How do we support the grid? especially in rural areas, whether you're in Arisag, whether you're in Picto, whether you're down in Digby, is that these are kind of rural areas where the where the grid may not be as strong as HRM. And so how can we actually play a role you know, within the fishing and aquaculture industries to actually make an impact? And then I see policies coming out from provincially and federally that support the adoption of electric vessels. So much the same way that if you want to go out and buy an electric car, electric scooter, electric bike, I can now do it for electric vessels. And those things will be in place for both, you know, First Nations and, and non-First Nations commercial fishers, so that they can make um, a decision as to whether, when and when they'll actually change. Um, and then there's a growing ecosystem of electric, both shoreside and vessel jobs in Nova Scotia. This is a big part of, you know, the conversation. So, but whether it's NSCC, the, community, the, uh, the college up in the strait, is that they're all looking at what this means to the industry. So right now, there's a big ecosystem that manages diesel engines. And guess what? Those are going to be changing over in the next ten, five or 10 years. And there's a whole ecosystem of new blood, new people that we need to be, have that come into the system to actually make a change. And then lastly, is we're going to be continuing to see intellectual property develop here in Nova Scotia that have global impact. So again, I want to thank you very much for the time today and uh, appreciate um, you know, giving the opportunity for the forum and keep the innovation acceleration down. Thanks again, thanks again and uh, I'll take some questions when it comes to the open forum. Cheers. Oof, wow. I could feel the energy there, James. Lots going on, lots of partnerships, uh, very exciting. So uh, great. Um, so if you have a question for James as well, just pop it into our Q&A, just make sure, uh, or if you have a question for any of our previous speakers today, just pop it in, maybe put their first name first so we just know who to direct the question to. And Minister, we're going to present our last award, our final award for today. So I will bring that up and get us set up and do that. So, yeah. Okay, there we go. So this is our, our final award today, the Lifetime Achievement Award. And Minister, would you do the honors?
Absolutely. It is certainly my pleasure, Karen. Thank you so much. I am pleased to present this Lifetime Achievement Award to Adelaide Cunningham to recognize his long, outstanding service to our industry. Over the years, Adelaide has represented his company, Sea Star Seafoods Limited, as a member of the Fisheries Council of Canada and the Lobster Council of Canada. His service has also included being a board member of the Nova Scotia Seafood Alliance. Congratulations, Adley, on receiving this award. We are all so grateful for your longstanding leadership. I really appreciate it. Um, I was hoping when they let me know that it would include maybe a uh, uh, all expenses paid trip to Hawaii or at least the Caribbean, but uh, I realize in these times of fiscal restraint that uh, that's not uh, that's not part of the program, but no, sincerely, I really appreciate it. And uh, really appreciate the work that the, that the province does in terms of marketing, um, you know, travel all over the globe to help us uh, sell, our, sell, our, uh, sell our product. So again, thank you uh, very much. And it's, uh, it's really, uh, really appreciated. So thanks again. Great, thank you, Adelaide. And congratulations on uh, your award and all the support that you've given to the seafood sector. You uh, truly deserve this honor. So this concludes uh, our fast moving <laughs> presentations and awards ceremony today, but now we'll move into some questions. So we definitely have some time for questions. So I'm gonna take a quick look at the Q&A and uh, yeah, our presenters can just come on if you'd like. And uh, I think I know I definitely have questions for all of you. Uh, I might start with Dan. I have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Certainly. And uh, yeah, great. So Dan, a couple of questions here popped up. Um, how long will the turbine panel last? Uh, I will say that the technology is evolving every day, but these panels are anticipated to last 25 years. Great. And uh, one more quick one there for you. Would this solution work for vessels everywhere in the province, or is this specific to LFA 3334? No, this this would work anywhere in the Maritimes. Um, we fish in the winter, and the reason we have wind is because we're in such a short or limited duration of daylight. And the important thing is you set your uh, solar panels equal to the same amount of degrees latitude you're at, so you catch the proper amount of sun where you're at. Thank you. Great. And uh, I just have one, just one more there for you, Dan, if you can... Uh... So Leanne would like to know, um, how has the response been from the fishermen in 33, 34 area? What is the pricing range for this system? Oh, thank you for that. Uh, first part of that question, there's been quite a bit of interest. Um, the FACTAP uh, program expired, the Fisheries and Aquaculture Clean Technology Adoption Program expired December 31st, which uh, really limited us to... Uh, how many people we could have participate in this. If the program were extended, I'm expecting we would have many more vessels involved in that. Um, depending on the vessel cost, of course, no HST in there, $8,000, 8,500 total. But when you're talking $1.25 a liter, liter um, your main propulsion engine will burn 26 and a half liters per hour. And when you talk about what this heater is going to be doing in conjunction with that, where it burns at its optimum, wide open would be half a liter, maybe down to much as a cup. It doesn't take too long to uh, uh, recoup the investment. And with the funding that we received here for a subsidy from FACTAP, it was uh, a lot of interest. And we're always seeking if we can find additional funds to help the membership. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, Mark, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions for you that are popping up. So can catchy be used for other fisheries globally? Yes, yeah, so our our uh, the the biggest market for us would be like the Mediterranean Sea and Japan actually, 
and uh, we really hope to expand globally. That's really you know our biggest market. And um, there's trawlers. There's thirty five thousand trawlers globally. So there's a lot of market out there for us. Right. Great. And another one following up on that, Mark. Um, what were the catch rates like? And did you do paired tows with the traditional trawl? So we didn't do paired tows with the traditional trawl. Um, the catch rates weren't spectacular. One of the reasons being that we went to an area where we would be alone. Uh, just the captain wasn't super comfortable with the system yet. So we didn't want to be amongst other vessels, uh, you know, quarter mile off that, you know, he didn't, he, was, he needed to always kind of look out. Um, so our catch rates weren't spectacular, but the one thing that is good is that the, the captain is comfortable with the system now. So our next fishing trip will be amongst other vessels. Um, he's on the shipyard now, so it's going to delay us a bit. So that could be uh, some redfish or it could be George's Bank. We're not 100% sure. Uh, but yeah, our next goal is to go amongst other trawlers to essentially compare catch rates, compare by catch numbers, things like that. Okay. Okay. And uh, they, they just keep coming in for you here. So when roughly uh, do you think that this will be like, it will be market available to fishers and what is the average cost for this? We're hoping, hoping early 2025, spring of 2025, um, but we would like to take pre-sales now so we would know, uh, because we are still a startup, you know, it'd be nice to know in advance what we're trying to deal with. And um, the system would cost roughly $130,000. Um, depending on what you have, you need some sensors as well, but most uh, fishermen around here do have the, the correct sensors that you would need anyways. Um, but with the fuel savings and the less gear repairs, you're expected to pay this off, you know, within a year, year and a half. So, um, so it is a big chunk up front, but, you know, going forward, you're going to save a lot of money. Okay. Great. Um, and oh, one more for you there, Mark, and then, uh, I'll move, move on. Just one second. Oh, and it, my question disappeared. So that's okay, Mark. I'll give you a break and I'll go on to James there. So James, I had some questions that came in for you. Um, is harvester perception the biggest hurdle for implementation currently? Um, I, I would say yes, um, from the perspective <laughs> that people have to see it running. They have to see it operating in a real world environment. I mean, it's running... You know, in the Norwegian fisheries, they're going to, they'll be decarbonized by 2026 in their fjords. And so we're seeing them running operationally daily in much colder weather than here in Canada. Um, but people have to see it running here in Nova Scotia. So I suspect that as we get more vessels that are actually operating, you know, in the lobster industry and some of the other, you know, agriculture industries, that they'll, they'll see that, you know, one, one third of the, the cost to operate it annually for fuel um, versus uh, diesel versus electric um, will be kind of a major incentive. And as diesel prices kind of keep encroaching ever, ever higher, um, that's a big part of their, um, uh, the cost. And so we can bring that cost down dramatically. And then with the bi-directional charging, we can, you know, have that vessel make money throughout the year, not just when it's in fishing season, but actually as it's being providing battery services. So you'll see more and more of those things help out the, the whole equation for people. Right. And I have this other one coming in. I'm not sure if you have a crystal ball, but in what year do you see all vessels in our inshore fleet, electric or hybrid? Well, you know, I, I, I'll i pick the electric one first. You know, I, I'll say in about, about 10, probably 15 years, probably most vessels that can will and the reason for that is that you're, you're seeing, you know, Cummins, Caterpillar and all that have um, very disruptive kind of schedules in front of them, especially by 2050. So the closer we get to 2050, um, they have plans and they have whole divisions that are fully electric. And so you'll see vessels that can move to electric um, make that jump uh, sooner than later. Uh, you see the cost of batteries come down dramatically. So I think that in the next five years, you'll probably see a big dramatic increase in the number of electric vessels in the province. And then um, on the hybrid side, you know, as as um, as things like hydrogen, 
you know, whether it's through uh, methanol, whether it's through ammonia, um, start to look at kind of fuel cells where you have plug-in electric hybrid vessels that can run in 33, 34, for example, um, is that you'll start to see that technology probably start to get, I'd say, mature enough to start the, the, the tests probably in about eight to 10 years time on that front. Great, thank you. Dan, I see, uh... Do you want to? Yes, please. Jump in? I, uh, yeah. Yes, please. I need to correct. I didn't want to provide wrong information, but I did misspeak. Um, Fact tap ended on March thirty first, not uh, December thirty first. I apologize for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Um, okay. And uh, oh, Mark, I found that other question for you. So, were the fuel savings expected? Were the fuel savings expected when this project was first conceived? Uh, not really, actually. It was kind of a welcome surprise. Um, but, you know, lifting a net off the seabed will have some fuel savings. Um, but we didn't expect this much um, with our system. But, yeah, it wasn't really the the point of it, I guess. The point of it was to just be a little bit more environmentally friendly, ha like help fishers deal with policy changes and things like that with bycatch. Um, but the fuel savings was a, a welcome bonus. <laughs> Great. Well, we, we went through our flurry of questions there. We've handed out all our presentations. Uh, Minister, were there are there any last words you would like to say today before we wrap up? Always love the opportunity to uh, to thank everyone for the hard work that goes into to things like this. Uh, certainly the presentations were exceptional. Uh, I, I expect a really good feedback to come out of this session. Uh, so Dan, Mark, James, thank you very much. James, you get uh, bonus points for mentoring Sheet Harbor. Uh, you mentioned it once. So uh, with the, the way to the minister's heart is through Sheet Harbor. So thank you for that. Uh, and certainly the all the team that came together to make the, make the event happen. And uh, I hope that this is a welcomed way to connect uh, industry, academia, uh, our department. Uh, we know that there's lots of conversations between this webinar series and the minister's conference. So we're looking at making sure that we uh, we put out a platform there that is well received by everyone. Uh, we're not uh, we're not married to one or the other. So there's always opportunities to evolve and and make sure that we're connecting with uh, with our our industries and our team and our families uh, the best way that we can. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and look forward to the next one. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to our presenters and all the award winners. Have a great afternoon.